Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined once again today by Professor Ben Nicholson, the author of our upcoming fourth Headstamp Publications book, uh, Clockwork Basilisk, The Early Revolvers of Elisha Collier, at Collier and Artemis Wheeler. And what we have here in front of us today mm. is a Jennings four-shot superposed flintlock rifle. Because what we want to talk about today are the early repeating guns. The, the Colt was certainly not the first repeater. Collier was not the first repeater. How early can you go and find repeating multi-shot firearms? You know, at this time, I think you have to, in this era, you have to sort of smush Europe and America together a little bit. Because not only are uh, the gunsmiths coming out of, uh, out of Europe, into America, um, but uh, within Europe there is uh, all sorts of camps that are working together and working against each other. And then on top of that, you have traditions from from the East. Right. This is not just a Western. Uh, uh, thing. No. There's there's a, there's a, in our catalog of uh, uh, weapons, revolving weapons. There's kind of as many uh, uh, revolvers from uh, India, and um, okay. All points uh, north and south. It is kind of funny that like everyone just acknowledges that yeah, yeah gunpowder was invented in China. Yeah. But then the idea of Chinese firearms, yeah. in my uh, experience, yeah. just stops. Right. And they're like everyone kind of has this idea of like oh they invented gunpowder. Yeah. And, and they then, got bored whoop, of it. And then yeah. everything came out of Europe. Yeah. But yeah. not yeah. entirely. Yes, I, I mean I, I think that uh, Islam had a lot to do with the development of firearms. And um, we, do, we we don't give that credit. No, we really uh, don't look into that. Uh, no, we don't, don't we don't do that, and, it, and it's a shame because it's a lot of big history. Ultimately, the uh, uh, making of steel and Damascus steel has a lot to do with this. Yeah, it would. And um, we understand that uh, Viking swords were made out of Damascus steel from Damascus, and there are thoughts that it, the, the, there is steel from Afghanistan that the Vikings used. So this was a pretty fluid trade. There was very much a global trade. Absolutely. Um, well Absolutely. before people think of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just as a side note, one of the cool things I learned a while back was yeah. before early on, the ivory that was used in Europe for yeah. decorations, yes. it wasn't elephant ivory. It was walrus ivory Boy. that was brought in from the Viking colonies on Greenland. That Boy. was one of their primary yeah. economic yeah. outputs Yes, was walrus ivory. Yeah. And like those old the, the sure. chess sets sure, sure, sure. decorative things. Yeah. Anyway, that's way off topic. Um, mm -hmm. How early do we go for a repeating firearm? Well, look, look there's a, a, a slew of them, when I say a slew, maybe five or six, uh, that are made in Germany. Okay. And uh, they, they uh, are beautiful firearms, princely. They're not like old dug up no. Smith and Wessons. They, they've got a lot of decoration, probably with, uh, with walrus ivory uh, uh, yeah. on them as well, actually. So ultimately, these <laughs> things are connected. Um, but they're so well made, and um, they there are some that people take to 1590s. It's a little bit early, but okay. nevertheless, um, they were being developed and thought about. Okay. So what is, this, I mean, a repeating firearm from 1590 or 1610, yeah. it's not yeah. going to be this. No. What, what are we talking about there? Uh -huh. Well, um, in essence, we're talking about the breach of a weapon. And if you can put five breaches in one block of steel, you've got a revolver. And then, of course, there's the uh, father of um, um, uh, Browning, who does the uh, slide block. Right, right, harmonica guns. Harmonica guns, and, and that's ultimately the same principle. <laughs> it, it, you don't go round and round, you just go straight across, and the thing jumps out uh, okay. the other side. So um, much of this has to do with your capacity to engineer the gap between the barrel and the cylinder. Because if you get sparks flying out on the side, not only do you hurt your hand, but you lose a lot of the power. Right. And that takes a lot of skill. Uh, it can be done by hand. And what made the Collier particularly successful uh, was that uh, machines did it. It okay. wasn't done by hand. That makes so you sense. don't get like the best gunsmith around who, who could handle this kind of 
uh, engineering technology, it was done by machine. You can you automate. That's right. You can, well, you can get a, t a two thousandths of an inch uh, accuracy, which right. is what you needed for that kind of thing. Right. A lathe is really a much more remarkable tool than a lot of people probably give it credit mm, for. Yeah. Well, so the cylinder gap is not just the only technical challenge to a revolving firearm. Yeah. You also have to figure out how to prime. Mm. Because we're not talking about cartridges, obviously. Yeah. This is all yeah. black powder muzzle loaded. Right. And at the very beginning, I assume we're talking match locks. Yes. Um, yes and then it's going to evolve to, I know the Germans tended to, they were big fans, especially the expensive guns, yeah. of wheel lock systems. Right. But then also flint locks. Yeah. And so how do you develop a multi-shot flint lock okay. priming system? Okay. okay, so in essence, you're looking at... Uh, the, I mean, the main problem is you, ha you have to have the primer on the face of the revolver. So naturally, if you turn the revolver around, it Whoop, pours it falls out. out. <laughs> right. So one solution was to have little tiny swing doors okay. that were operated by a lever. So when you pull the cock back, there's another lever pushed the, uh, the, uh, the, the gate okay. open and exposed the powder. Okay. Then another system was to have sliding priming pans. So okay. they, they, these are uh, kind of humped rectangles that fit in tracks, and uh, you pull the cock back, and a, a lever shoots forward and exposes it. Okay. Um, then there was another group of, of firearm designers starting in the 1690s who reckoned that if you have a little box and you have your primer in there and you tilt it forward on top of the priming pan and go like that, you could get a dump and then get it out the way. And then uh, later designers realized, well, you could put a little valve in there so that when you uh, have, it, have it go forward, you would also have the steel, i.e. the face of the frizzen, uh, part of that box. Okay. So when the uh, 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 cock comes down, the flint hits the, the steel, then the magazine frizzen pops out of the way, right? That's really, for reloaders, that sounds just like a powder throw. But yeah, it, a very right. tiny powder That's throw it. built into sure. the frizzen. Sure. Every time it's like whoop, whoop, yeah. and it spits out and it's, a and little, it, just a bit of priming powder. Yeah. And you don't need much. It's a, 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 so this box would, would uh, easily accommodate five, seven shots okay. of primer powder. One problem, not major, but you have to have two flasks. Okay. One for the primer and one for the uh, powder. But that's pretty typical, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It okay. Is. Mm -hmm. so, so we're talking largely revolving systems. Are yeah. we talking handguns, long guns, both? Actually, both. Okay. Yeah, both. The, 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 the benefit of a, of a long gun is you have more room. Okay. Uh, the the, the uh, lock can be a little bit longer because it's uh, associated with the arm. Uh, where uh, and it can be heavier, uh, more robust. Uh, the pistol, everything starts to shrink. No problem, but uh, there is a difference between the two. Okay, it would certainly get harder to make, it, and the engineering yeah. challenges increase a bit if you have to miniaturize things a bit. It does, and it becomes more delicate, hmm. uh, which is another issue. But but uh, there was more systems than than just this. I mean, there's uh, the the Dolip, Giorgio. I don't know what. The Italian is for the, that, for the word. Yeah. That, that's either like a Vatican rank or a Ben and Jerry's flavor. I'm not sure which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Instead of lead balls, you get raisins, right? So. <laughs> All right. So what is that thing? Uh, so this is a design that is uh, it's hard, hard to describe, but we have to do it. One barrel, a okay. revolving cylinder, and then a, a uh, funnel that goes from the width of the cylinder down towards the barrel. Okay. So you fire a shot and the ball goes and flies out of the barrel. <laughs> and could they really do that without all the powder just blowing around it? There are two, in, two known. Wow. You know, and two exist. And uh, this is when you want to own a big firearm collection and have a go. I want to, yeah, I want to try it. <laughs> I want, no, I want to watch someone else try shooting. Right. Then I'll try it myself. That's the arm around the oak tree, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's, that perfectly okay. solves the cylinder gap issue there because is it's completely gap. contained. Right, right. Now, right. it may not work, 
But it's at least not going well, to... Well, it worked enough for someone remain. to make a couple yeah. and for them to remain. But you're right. I so mean, where did the... Who is, who's buying these? Who, who are these made for? These, well, were um, they ever... Let, let me start with, were yeah. they ever military? Or do we know? No record of a revolver prior okay. to 18... Uh, it sounds like something that any yeah. properly trained yeah. military commander with an eye to logistics and actual campaigning would look at and just go, oh, no, no, no. Uh -huh. oh, right. No, I, no. I mean, you read, you read these wonderful reports uh, from military commanders saying that uh, every weapon you have to, that you bring to us has to be uh, basically um, uh, usable by someone who has very little understanding of anything. <laughs> You know, Collier yeah, is a kind of complex. Uh, exactly. Like, I don't know that it quite That's fits one, that. the reason, not one okay. of the reason why I didn't go. It's like, who's going to futz and fuddle with this thing? And certainly some of the, like you talked about, yeah. princely German examples. Certainly yes. one market for this is the wealthy aristocrat or royalty or right. somewhere in between. Right. Merchants. Who has a taste for fine new technology and sure. can afford to yeah. pay a craftsman to spend a month building one yeah. gun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it would certainly be understandable that those are some of the guns that are going to survive the best because yeah. they're going to be cared for because they're extremely valuable items, even when they're made. Yes, yes. I, 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 the collection that I would love to be able to study in depth was, was it, was it Louis XIII, uh, who, who um, was a gun nut at the age of 12 yeah. or something like that. It and was he, one of the Louis. It, it was one of the Louis, right? I don't recall who now. Yeah. yeah. But he kept his head on, I think. I, think, <laughs> I don't think it got lost. Only the 16th had that issue. <laughs> a little bit later, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that collection will have these kinds of peculiar firearms where someone uh, is, you know, has got the time, they got the money, and they're going to try it out. Okay. Now, when it comes to some of, <laughs> I like this, more modern stuff, yeah, you know, sure. 1700s. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, in our... our Lead off. We were talking about th well things yeah. like this. Yeah. There were actually a number of repeating firearms that were presented and even used by the U.S. military yes. right. prior to the Collier. Right. So right. What are those? Well, let's look at the context. Uh, if you have two ships uh, advancing upon each other, the ships weren't that big, and you didn't have that many Marines, i.e., soldiers who would do the deck fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have too many. So if you have an effective force multiplier, i.e. not one soldier, one musket who's going to take a minute to reload. If you have a force multiplier, then you will beat them on in the Navy. Okay. So a lot of these firearms are being uh, commissioned by the Navy. Okay. Um, and they're not buying a huge number of them because small troops, and so it can be worth the expense of a more sure. complicated gun. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So what we understand is that, um, okay, so America and England were going at each other in the 1812 so war, I've heard. right? <laughs> Something like that. And uh, the Brits got Canada and the Yanks got uh, south of the lakes, basically. And there mm -hmm. was Frenchmen in there involved. Somewhere. Yeah. Some, somewhere. somewhere. Down at the bottom, uh, on the rivers. So... Um, they, there, were, there was white water, not blue water, battles. Now, the Brits couldn't get their ships over the Niagara Falls. Big problem. So the, the, the British Navy had a problem with fighting the, the white water navies that the Americans had a better handle on. Okay. Um, so the, uh, in the 1812 war, there were multi-shot... Uh, uh, weapons that the Americans were using, but the Brits didn't have them. I did actually film a Chambers, I call it a machine gun, Yeah. but a, a seven-barreled, superposed, 32 shots per barrel. Yikes. So a 224-round machine gun. That's what you need. That uh, was originally proposed to the Continental Congress in 1792. Ooh. And they didn't accept it. Yeah. And the guy... When, when war were declared in 1812, sure. Chambers came back and went, are you sure you don't want this? Sure. And then the Navy sure. got real excited. And as, as you said, it was valuable to the Navy in particular, and they bought several dozen of them. Right. Um, I think there was, wasn't there one even earlier? Um, n not to my knowledge, but okay. uh, it, it's not an endless bottomless pit. Okay. So uh, I, I'll stop at Belton. Okay. And then yeah, right, that's the one I'm thinking. Oh, okay. Belton. Okay. Belton's yeah. project. Now, these were 
uh, it's just like having a big firework uh, uh, on, on, on July the 4th. Okay. Uh, you send out, a, it's a Roman candle, right? You send out boof, 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 boof. And these are all uh, uh, shots whereby the flame passes through a tunnel and goes to the next shot. That's a okay. Roman candle. That's what these weapons were. Okay. So uh, it got up on the top of the deck, but it would take hours to reload that thing. It was a one-hit deal. But it solves both <clears throat> of your priming and your cylinder gap problems. There is no cylinder, Absolutely. so there's no cylinder gap. Absolutely. And you don't have to worry about priming because those two, at least, yeah. you only you get you fire it once, right. and you light off the front charge, sure. and it just automatically yeah. works its way back till it's empty. Yeah, and then you fire it, aim it at somebody else, and boof, it goes out, and 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 it's a sequential right. project like that. The chambers, what I read was it was about 120 rounds a minute, and I'm not surprised by modern machine gun standards. That's extremely Pretty slow. Good. It would give you plenty of time yes. to sweep the decks yes, of an enemy sure. ship. Half a second, right? Yeah. 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 The 224 rounds, 120 rounds a minute, you're going to get almost two solid minutes. Right. Unless it malfunctions, which I'm sure at least one barrel probably would at some probably point. Probably why there's more than one barrel. Yeah. Right? Now, this weapon yeah. solves that problem. Okay. Because the uh, lock is on a track that slides. Okay. And so there are one, two, three, four superposed loads, and you fire this one and then slide the lock back and open up the next uh, priming uh, hole okay. and get to the next shot. So you can be, you, it's, you're controlling the gun, the gun's not controlling you. Okay. So this is a big breakthrough. And um, uh, 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 they were built by the United States. Um, I understand that they were. Uh, in, in, used and incorporated, okay. and uh, the general thought is that uh, the uh, arsenal at um, uh, River River Forge, Harper's Ferry, excuse me, Harper's Ferry, um, built a hundred of them. Okay. At the same time as which built a hundred uh, wheelers, which was uh, the American version of the Collier. Okay. So this is sketchy knowledge because it's just a paragraph in a in a document uh, in 1829 where the writer in the in the Franklin Journal uh, about patent history and patents, you know, what's mm -hmm. hot this year, and there's this incredibly important paragraph that says that there were a hundred rotating cylinder we, uh, wheelers uh, built by uh, by the Harpers Ferry Arsenal. That's a okay. major big deal. Yep. Really is, and, and that at that time there was a a second uh, repeating firearm, and it's very likely to be this. Okay, I can't answer that for sure. They don't quite exactly like say mm -mm. it was. No. Okay. I mean, this is the beauty of history; it's sketchy, right? But the funny thing is, we don't have one of those wheelers. No one's found one, but we do have right one. Or I think there are a couple but, of these. Out well, there. yeah. I mean, not that I've looked hard, but I, I'm aware that there's three. This is. A, um, apparently, this one's come through uh, a family for a number of uh, years. Nice. Not okay. through the auction sales. Okay. So, <clears throat> Colt, to jump forward, mm. Colt is often seen as the, the original progenitor mm. of the repeating, revolving yeah. firearm. Yeah. And he definitely was not. We've just gone through things yeah. that predate Colt by yeah. literally centuries. Yes. Um, now, Colt certainly is the first to make it. Um, Call it commercial, really yes. truly successful That's fair. commercial. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but we have all of these gradual increments yeah. of repeating firearms that kind of peak at the Collier. Yeah. Yeah. Which does it in a very elegant and a very high quality manner. Yeah. But unsustainably expensive, perhaps unsustainably complex for its day. Yes. And it's Colt that's able to make it commercially successful. Yeah. But. Some of the claims that Colt made about the originality of all his design elements may not be entirely true. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was, look, neither of us met him, but we have seen pictures of him, and uh, you would have to be really on your toes if you met this guy. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know. He's the sort of person that you want to, you certainly don't want to get in debt to Sam Colt. I, I don't think so. Uh, but um, you'd want to be careful making any legal deals with Sam Colt. He, what was interesting about Colt, I mean, he was really savvy, and I think a very good researcher. 
I mean, he, if he was making something, he wanted to know what had happened before. And for that, I respect him. And he knew about all these guns. Well, he certainly did, because he gave a lecture in London in 1851, uh, the time of the 1851 cult, which was a you know, serious uh, right. weapon. Um, and and um, he delivered to the Institute of Civil Engineers a history lesson on revolvers. This is our first history lesson of revolvers published. And um, in that lecture, there, are, uh, uh, there is one weapon that has a hand that rotates the cylinder. Oh. And he says, <laughs> there is an interesting gun out there. He didn't bring it to the, to the, to the lecture. He didn't illustrate it in the lecture. He said it, it had an interesting action. And he actually owned it, right? No. Okay. He, there was another one that used to belong in the Royal uh, uh, Armouries, the tower at that time. There is a record that we have located for this gun, and poof, it's in his private collection. Huh. How convenient. And that is not in the lecture. Interesting. So you have two weapons that have a, a re revolving cylinder. You pull the cock back, the cylinder rotates, there's a cylinder stop, and the slide is open for the primer. So the three biggies are all in, the, in there. And right. he was not telling anybody he had it. It somehow got into his, hmm. into his possession. All right. But well, at least it exists, that, that gun. That's fantastic. Yeah, it does exist. And I think we need to make a separate video all about some of the... Shenanigans. The shenanigans, that's the perfect term. <laughs> the cult shenanigans surrounding his patents and yeah. inventions and lawsuits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why don't we call it quits for today? Yeah, sure. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I did actually previously film an, an Indian uh, four-shot revolving matchlock rifle. So I'll include a link to that at the end of this video. You can take a look at an example of what it's very hard to date those, and we don't have a firm date on the one that I filmed, but probably yep. 1600s. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So you can take a look at that if you're interested in it. Uh, and if you would like to know more about this whole subject, well, the best source on it is Professor Nicholson's new book, which we are currently running the Kickstarter campaign for. Um, we have several different versions of the book to offer, and we can show you some... Uh, uh, mock-ups of the, what the pages are going to look like and a bunch of accessories to go with it and all sorts of cool stuff um, in the Kickstarter campaign, which is linked in the description below. So check that out if you're interested. And if not, hopefully you enjoyed the video and thank you for watching.